Chester Key, Tracer of Lost Persons, a new weekly feature on NBC's All-Star Festival of mystery, comedy, music, and drama, brought to you by Anison for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia, by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music and first in television, and by Chesterfield, always milder, better tasting, cooler smoking, plus no unpleasant aftertaste. Every day you hear more and more about an incredibly fast way to relieve the pains of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia. It's Anison, A-N-A-C-I-N. Now, the reason Anison is so wonderfully fast-acting and effective is this. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Thousands of people have received envelopes containing Anison tablets from their own dentist or physician and in this way discovered the incredibly fast relief Anison brings from pains of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. So the next time a headache strikes, take Anison, A-N-A-C-I-N. Anison comes in handy boxes of 12 and 30, economical family-sized bottles of 50 and 100. Ask for Anison at any drug counter. <laughs> Mr. Keene, tracer of lost persons, one of the most famous characters of American fiction in one of radio's most thrilling dramas. Tonight, the famous old investigator's case is entitled The Photograph Album Murder Case. Our scene opens at 11 o'clock at night as a taxi cab pulls up before a house in one of New York's finer residential districts. A young girl, attractive and well-dressed, gets out of the taxi. The girl's eyes are blurred with tears as she starts towards the house, unaware that someone is waiting in the shadows. My key. It, it must be here in my handbag. If only I can get into the house, to my room before... Who's there? There's someone there in the shadows. You! What are you... No! Put down that knife! No! Which one of you gentlemen is Mr. Keene? Well, this is Mr. Keene, young fella. I'm his partner, Mike Clancy. Mr. Keene, I'm Larry Benton. Oh, yes, Mr. Benton. You're the young man who phoned for an appointment. Yes. Mr. Keene, did you read in the morning paper about the murder of a girl named June Reynolds? Yes, Mr. Benton, I did. It occurred around 11 o'clock last night. The young woman was an actress, I believe the newspaper said. That's right, Mr. Keene. June was stabbed to death as she was about to enter the house. Sure, and I read about it too, Mr. Keene. The young lady's handbag was stolen, and the police figure some hoodlum robbed her and stabbed her to death when she tried to call for help. Only they're wrong, Mr. Clancy, completely wrong. June was deliberately murdered. Her handbag was stolen to to throw the police off the track. Mr. Benton, just how are you related to the murdered girl? And why do you believe robbery was not the motive for the murder? June Reynolds was my fiancée, Mr. Keene. We... We've been going together ever since she came to New York from a little town in Iowa a year ago. She worked as a stenographer in the same firm where I'm employed as an accountant. Only June's real ambition was to become an actress. I see. She belonged to one of those little amateur theater groups in Greenwich Village. One night, about a month ago, she was in a play down there, and Mrs. Elsa Foster saw her and decided to sponsor her. She said June had great talent and ought to become an actress. Elsa Foster? You mean the wealthy society woman? Yes, Mr. Keene. Mrs. Foster took June to live with her in her beautiful home. She persuaded June to give up her job as a stenographer and devote all her time to studying for the theater. I... I begged you not to accept Mrs. Foster's offer. Well, sure, and why did you object to her living in an elegant house with a rich society lady? Because, Mr. Clancy, I... I had a feeling there was something strange about it. Mrs. Foster seemed to take charge of June completely. Whenever I phoned the house, I was told June couldn't talk to me. She never called me back, and... 
when I finally did get to see her, she... Yes, Miss Benton. Go on. June was like a different person, Mr. Keene. She seemed terribly worried about something. Then yesterday afternoon, I met her outside Mrs. Foster's home. I was stunned to see how pale she was. I could see that she was desperately afraid of something. Saints preserve us, but what would the young lady be afraid of, Mr. Benton? She wouldn't tell me, Mr. Clancy. But she did say that she was leaving Mrs. Foster's house the very next day. Leaving it forever. Only she was murdered before she had a chance. Mr. Keene, I need your help. I want June Reynolds' murderer found and brought to justice. My partner and I are always interested in seeing justice done, Mr. Benton. And from what you've told me, there is strong doubt that robbery was the real murder motive. Now tell me, who else lives in the Foster home besides Elsa Foster? There's her husband, Rodney Foster. He's much younger than his wife. And there's Mrs. Foster's niece, Hazel. She's... Yes? What about her, Mr. Benton? She's a strange, neurotic girl. For some reason, I, I had a feeling she hated June, though I don't know why. Mr. Keene, you... You will take the case, won't you? Yes, Mr. Benton. My partner and I will get to work on it immediately. Now, put your address on this slip of paper, please. We'll be in touch with you as soon as we have some news. Now, Mike... Uh, yes, boss? We'll go directly to Mrs. Foster's home and start our investigation of June Reynolds' murder at the scene of the crime. <laughs> Here's the foster home, Mr. Keene. Sure, and it's a beautiful house. Yes, Mike. And June Reynolds must have been stabbed to death right here at the front door. Well, I'll, I'll ring the bell, sir. Yes? What is it? Are you Mrs. Elsa Foster? I am. My name is Keene. I'm a private investigator. And this is my partner, Mike Clancy. Mr. Keene, uh, come in. Thank you. We should like to ask you a few questions, Mrs. Foster, about the murder of June Reynolds. About June's murder? Surely there's no reason to investigate her murder, Mr. Keene. It's obvious that some hoodlum robbed her and stabbed her to death when she tried to cry out for help. It's quite possible, Mrs. Foster, that the person who murdered June Reynolds hoped the police would think exactly that. I understand that June Reynolds was your protege, that you were encouraging her to become an actress, and that she was living here in your home. Yes, Mr. Keene. I wanted to help her in every way possible. You see, I was on the stage myself some years ago. I suppose I wanted June Reynolds to become the great actress I had once hoped to be. You must have become very devoted to the murdered girl, Mrs. Foster. Why, I... Yes. Mr. Keene, who asked you to investigate this case? The murdered girl's fiancé, Larry Benton. Larry Benton? Larry Benton? You seem upset. Mr. Keene, what did Larry tell you? What did he say about me? Mrs. Foster... Larry Benton hates me. And if anyone had a motive for murdering June, I suggest it was Larry Benton. The young man says he was in love with her. Why do you make such an accusation, Mrs. Foster? I... Mr. Keene, I... I shouldn't have said that. I... I don't know what came over me. I... Oh, sir, my dear. Who, who are these men? Rodney, dear. This is Mr. Keene, the private investigator. And Mr. Clancy. Mr. Keene, this is my husband... Rodney Foster. How do you do, Mr. Foster? Glad to know you. How do you do? Rodney, that young man, Larry Benton, has asked Mr. Keene to investigate June Reynolds' murder. Really? Why, Mr. Keene? Because there seems to be some doubt, Mr. Foster, that robbery was the motive for the murder. There may have been another reason. Good heavens. Then that ties in with... With what? Rodney, don't. Please don't say anything. Well, to my dear, I think Mr. Keene should know the facts. And just what are the facts? Mr. Keene... Last night, my wife and I made a discovery which may have some bearing on June Reynolds' murder. Rodney, please. I suggest you allow your husband to go on, Mrs. Foster. When I returned from a business trip to South America a week ago, I brought a present for my wife, an expensive diamond necklace. Last night, we discovered it was missing from the safe. Could it have been mislaid? Hardly. Miss Keene, I suspected that the necklace might have been stolen by June Reynolds. After all, we knew very little about the girl when she came here to live. Did you confront her with your suspicions? I didn't have a chance. June had gone out for the evening. I intended to question her in the morning. Now I'm wondering if she wasn't mixed up in some way with criminals. And if the theft of my wife's diamond necklace had something to do with her murder. Rodney, I'm sure you're wrong. 
you, Mr. Mr. Foster, I take it you told the police about the missing necklace. Why, no, I haven't. Why not? Mr. Keene, I... I asked my husband not to say anything about it to the police. June Reynolds is dead, murdered. It would be cruel to cast suspicion on her name. And the diamond necklace was insured, so there'll be no loss. I agree to go along with my wife on the matter, Mr. Keene. The fact that you concealed the theft of the necklace from the police, Mr. Foster, places you and your wife in a suspicious light. People who hide facts in a murder case often have a sinister reason for doing so. Mr. Keene... Are you trying to imply that my wife or I had anything to do with the murder? I'm only telling you what the police may think. Mrs. Foster, during the time she lived here with you, did the murdered girl seem worried about anything or frightened? Why, why no, Mr. Keene. June seemed very happy. I see. I should like to have a look at June Reynolds' room. Her, her room? But the... There may be something in her effects that will give us a clue to her murder. Uh, where is her room, Mrs. Foster? It's the last door at the end of the hall. I'll show you. Don't bother. Mike Clancy and I will find the way. Come along, Mike. Right, sir. What do you think, Mr. Keene? Do Mr. and Mrs. Foster know more about the murder than they're saying? It's hard to say, Mike. Well, this must be June Reynolds' room. Uh, Mike, look through the dresser for any letters or papers. Anything that might be a clue. Right, boss. Closet is full of expensive clothes. <laughs> Mrs. Foster must have bought them for June Reynolds. Well, there's nothing in them dresser drawers, Mr. Keene. They're all empty. Oh, look, boss. Here's one of them little powder boxes on the dresser. I wonder if it's the kind that plays a tune when you open it. Well, sure enough, it plays it. There's the silver, Mr. Keene. Look what's in the powder box. It's a necklace, Mike. A diamond necklace. Then the murdered girl, June Reynolds, must have stolen it. Like Mr. Foster said. She must have hidden it in here. Put down that necklace. What? Why, it's a young lady. Who are you, miss? What are you doing in this room? Do you mind telling us who you are? Give me that necklace. Give it to me, do you hear? Boss, she's got a gun. Yes, I've got a gun. And I'll use it if you don't give me that necklace. <laughs> will return in just a moment, but first, here's a word from RCA Victors. If you think back just three years, you'll recognize the tremendous strides television has made in bringing us finer entertainment. Keeping pace with these advances is your local radio television serviceman. He's your neighborhood community servant, whose job it's been to keep his knowledge and equipment up to date in order to provide you with prompt, dependable service. If your own set develops trouble, your radio television service man will recommend the right parts and tubes to restore it to top performance standards. For example, if you should need a new picture tube, regardless of the make or model of your set, he'll recommend a genuine RCA picture tube. Your repairman knows from experience that an RCA picture tube will give you the clearest, sharpest picture your set is capable of delivering. Yes, with an RCA picture tube, you're sure of enjoying the very best that your television set has to offer. Now back to Mr. Keene and the photograph album, Murder Case. Mr. Keene is investigating the murder of June Reynolds, beautiful young actress who was stabbed to death outside the home of wealthy, socially prominent Elsa Foster, who had been sponsoring her career. In the room which June occupied in the Foster's home, Mr. Keene and his partner, Mike Clancy, have discovered a missing diamond necklace. But now an intensely distraught young girl with a gun in her hand is saying to them, Give me that necklace or I'll kill you. I warn you. Oh, no, you don't, young lady. There, I've got the gun. Well, that's a nasty weapon for a young lady to be carrying around. Who are you? I'm Hazel Collins, and... I've got a right to be here, but you haven't. Well, this is Mr. Keene, young lady. Oh, Mr. Keene? The famous investigator? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't know. I came in here and saw you with Aunt Elsa's diamond necklace. And then you are Elsa Foster's niece. Yes. And you recognize this diamond necklace? Of course I do. Where did you find it? It was in that powder box on the dresser. I might have known it. 
I might have known June Reynolds was a thief. I warned Aunt Elsa that June was no good. I take it, Miss Collins, you didn't like the murdered girl. Why would I like her? What right had she to come into this house and take everything that belonged to me? I'm Aunt Elsa's niece. But you'd have thought that it was the other way round. Well, I'm glad, she said. I'm glad. Yes, Miss Mr. Keene, she don't sound normal. Miss Collins, hate as strong as yours could be a motive for murder. Mr. Keene, if you're looking for a motive for June Reynolds' murder... Why don't you find out how Aunt Elsa really felt about June? Just how did she feel? She hated June Reynolds. But your aunt befriended June. Why would she have done that if she hated her? Oh, my aunt didn't hate June at first, Mr. Keene. It was only after Aunt Elsa's husband, Rodney Foster, came back from South America and Aunt Elsa realized what was happening. Miss Collins, just what do you mean? Have you met Uncle Rodney? Have you noticed how much younger he is than my Aunt Elsa? June Reynolds was young, too. You mean to say that your aunt's husband was in love with the murdered girl? I knew he took her out to dinner, Mr. Clancy. He met her outside the house. Aunt Elsa knew it, too. She's always been intensely jealous of Uncle Rodney. Hazel, what are you doing here? Oh, Uncle Rodney, I... What, what has my wife's niece been telling you, Mr. Keene? Some rather interesting things, Mr. Foster. I've been telling Mr. Keene the truth, Uncle Rodney. That besides seeing you behind Aunt Elsa's back, June Reynolds was also a thief. Go to your room, Hazel. No, I, I don't want to. I... Do as I tell you. Very well, I'll, I'll go. But June Reynolds was a thief. She was a thief. Mr. King, I must apologize for Hazel. She hasn't been well mentally for quite a while, and... The great Scott, you found my wife's diamond necklace. Yes, Mr. Foster. It was in that powder box on the dresser. Then June Reynolds must have stolen it. Mr. Keene, this will break my wife's heart. She was so devoted to June. And what about you, Mr. Foster? I hardly knew the girl. I met her for the first time when I got back from South America a week ago. But you knew her well enough to take her to dinner, to meet her at places outside your home. What? Well, how did you... Then it's true, Mr. Foster. I... Very well, Mr. Keene. I won't deny it. I was attracted to June in spite of myself. I, I met her secretly several times. But after the other evening, I realized what a fool I was. What about the other evening, Mr. Foster? I'd met June in a restaurant on 53rd Street. Suddenly, Larry Benton walked in. Larry Benton? June Reynolds' fiancé? Yes. Larry flew into a jealous rage and made wild threats against both June and me. Well, sure, Mr. Keene, Larry Benton never mentioned that fact to us. No, Mike, he didn't. I'm... I'm beginning to wonder now if Larry Benton didn't carry out his threat against June and, and murder her. There's also another possibility, Mr. Foster. What is that? You admit that you were infatuated with June. If she turned you down, that might be a clear motive for murder. No! I... I was attracted to her, but it really meant nothing, Mr. King. I'm in love with my wife, Elsa. Unfortunately, you've also put your wife in a highly suspicious position. Elsa? Why, well, she didn't even know I was meeting June. You can't be sure of that. Your wife may have learned of it in some way and taken matters into her own hands. No! No! Elsa would never commit a murder. Jealousy is a strong incentive for murder. That same motive which you say could have driven Larry Benton to violence. Come along, Mike. Where to, Mr. Keene? I want to have another talk with Larry Benton, the murdered girl's fiancé. This time, he won't withhold important facts, as he obviously did before. <laughs> Larry Benton's room is on the fourth floor, Mr. Keene. The getting there is like climbing a mountain. Mike, listen. There's something going on at the top of the stairs, where the door is open. Well, it must be Larry Benton's room. Hazel, you don't know what you're saying. Mr. Keene, it's Elsa Foster's niece, Hazel Collins. Yes, Mike, and Larry Benton. I think you'd better leave, Hazel, before you say any more. You're a fool, Larry Benton. You knew June Reynolds had thrown you over. You knew... Well, Miss Collins... Get out of my way! Come on, Mike. Who's there? Oh, Mr. Keene. Yes, Mr. Benton. We just met Hazel Collins, Mrs. Foster's niece on the stairs. Come in, Mr. Keene. Mr. Clancy. Hazel Collins came here to, uh... to bring me some of June Reynolds' belongings. Things that 
she knew had a sentimental value for me. Tell me, Larry Benton, why did you lie to me when you came to my office this morning? Lie? I didn't lie. You neglected to tell us about your quarrel with June Reynolds in a restaurant a few days before she was murdered. So you... you found out about that. I suggest you tell us just what happened. All right, Mr. Keene, I... I, I hadn't seen June in several days. Then that night I walked into the restaurant and saw her having dinner with Mrs. Foster's husband, Rodney Foster. I... I, I, I was furious at him. And at June. Furious enough to commit murder? See here, Mr. Keene. Mr. Benton, the fact that you omitted telling us this puts you in a very suspicious light. Now, is there anything else which you've neglected to tell us? I... All right. I, I guess I should have told you this, too. I... I saw June about an hour before she was murdered. What? Where did you see her, Mr. Benton? I asked her to meet me here in my apartment. I, I wanted a showdown about Rodney Foster. We called, and I... I put her in a cab, and she went home. Why didn't you tell me this before? Because I knew you'd think that I murdered June in a fit of jealous rage, and I didn't. I swear I didn't. Mr. Benton, what about Hazel Collins, Elsa Foster's niece? It was Hazel who told me that June and Rodney Foster were... were seeing each other secretly. She bitterly resented her aunt's interest in June. It appears to me Hazel Collins is in love with you. And that would account for her hatred of June. Oh, Mr. Benton, these things here on the table, are they June Reynolds' personal effects? Yes, Mr. Keene, they're just some trinkets. And that photograph album, which I'm going to send back to June's sister in Iowa. Well, that's funny, boss. We didn't see any of them things in June Reynolds' room. I imagine Hazel Collins had already taken them, Mike. Well, this photograph album seems to contain quite a number of pictures. Yes, Mr. Keene. June's sister will probably want it. Mike. Uh, what is it, boss? I've just made a rather astonishing discovery. Larry Benton, I want to borrow this photograph album. Mr. Keene, what is it? Why are you staring at that snapshot? I want you to remain here in this room until I get in touch with you, Mr. Benton. Mike, we're going back to the office. I'm going to make a long-distance phone call. And then I think we'll be ready to close in on June Reynolds' murderer. <laughs> Mr. Clancy. Come in. Thank you, Mr. Foster. Is your wife at home? I'd like to talk to her again. Yes, Elsa's in the library. Come right in. Who is it, Rodney? Oh, Mr. Keene and Mr. Clancy. You have news of June's murder? I'm afraid what I have to say won't be pleasant, Mrs. Foster. I... I don't understand. Mrs. Foster, the murdered girl, June Reynolds, was a guest in your home. She accepted your generosity and kindness. And it would appear that in return, she became involved in a love affair with your husband. Keen, how dare you? Your wife already knows it, Mr. Foster. Mrs. Foster, you found out through your niece, Hazel Collins, that June and your husband were seeing each other secretly. You were intensely jealous. And jealousy is a strong motive for murder. Elsa. Elsa, that it was you. No, Rodney. I didn't kill June. I swear. I can prove who stabbed June Reynolds to death, Mrs. Foster. If I were to tell you that I checked with a taxi driver who brought her home last night, that he was an eyewitness to the murder... That's a lie. The taxi drove off before... Before the murder was committed. That's right, Mr. Foster. But you couldn't know that unless you were the one who stabbed June Reynolds. You're the murderer, and you trapped yourself with your own words. Pretty clever, aren't you, Keene? <laughs> Rodney! You murdered June Reynolds, and you took her handbag to make it look like robbery. You also planted the diamond necklace in her room. I suspected your guilt, Foster, when I discovered a snapshot in June's photograph album. Snapshot? What snapshot, King? It was a picture of the murdered girl taken when she was a youngster in her teens. There was an older girl with her, her sister, and a man whom I recognized as you, Rodney Foster. I made a long-distance phone call to June Reynolds' sister in Iowa, and she told me the entire story. So you found out I was married to June's sister. Married to... <gasps> Mrs. Foster, nine years ago, Rodney Foster was married to June Reynolds' sister. But he deserted her. He disappeared from that little Iowa town. And he never troubled to obtain a divorce. No. Oh, no. His marriage to you a few years later was a bigamous marriage. And no one would have known, Elsa, if you hadn't brought that girl, June Reynolds, into this house. When I got back from South America, June recognized me right away. She gave me three days to tell you the truth. If I didn't, 
She said she would. I had to kill her to keep her quiet. Just as I'll have to keep you quiet, King. Sense for Zorba. She's got a knife. Yes. The knife I used on June Reynolds. I intend to use it again if you come near me. He's trying to get away, Mike. Oh, no, no, you don't. Yes, let's go. Drop it. Drop it. Drop that oh, knife. Oh, there. Oh, there. I've got it, Mr. King. Good work, Mike. One stabbing is quite enough. As you'll find out, Rodney Foster, when you await your punishment in the electric chair for the murder of June Reynolds. the solution to the photograph album Murder King. Hello, folks. This is Bob Chesterfield Hope telling you that your summer fun is just starting when you pack them by the carton. Of course, I mean cartons of those milder Chesterfields. Think of it this way, folks. Vacation time is time to enjoy yourself. Time to go where you want, do what you want. A natural time to smoke the cigarette that gives you all the pleasure you want. Chesterfield. Remember, Chesterfields are milder. Always milder, better tasting, and cooler smoking. Yep, Chesterfield gives you all that plus, the added pleasure of no unpleasant aftertaste. And take it from me, folks, that's the biggest plus in cigarette history. So slip a couple of cartons of Chesterfields in that vacation suitcase. Remember the words of Bob Chesterfield Hope. Whether you go by plane, train, or bus, take the cigarette with mildness plus. I mean, Chesterfield. Listen again next week to Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, a new weekly feature on NBC's All-Star Festival of mystery, comedy, music, and drama. Brought to you by Anison for fast relief from pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia. By RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, and first in television. And by Chesterfield, always milder, better tasting, cooler smoking, plus no unpleasant aftertaste. Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, is based on the novel Mr. Keene. The radio sequel is originated and produced by Frank and Ann Hummer. Dialogue by Gene Carroll, directed by Richard Leonard. Philip Clark plays Mr. Keene, your announcer, Jack Costello. Remember, Mr. Keene is now on the air at this new time, every Friday at 9.30 Eastern Daylight Saving Time. Don't miss Mr. Keene next Friday when the kindly old tracer turns to the case of the strange murder of Carrie Ellis. Story of a Letter, next on NBC.